Hello and welcome to another video by Mrs. W for iUniversity Prep. This video for you guys is going to cover the relationship between photosynthesis and cellular respiration. And our essential question for this video is how is solar energy converted into a chemical energy that can be used by the cells? And that's really what I want you guys to focus on when we talk about um, photosynthesis and cellular respiration is really, it's just an energy transfer. If you guys remember back to my lesson on energy, energy cannot be created or destroyed. But we know we need energy in the form of ATP for our cellular work, but how are we gonna get it there? How are we going to transform or transfer that energy from solar energy all the way to ATP. And it's a two-step process, photosynthesis and cellular respiration. So let's take a look. First, again, just a reminder that we're looking at an energy transfer. And some questions to help guide this through. Energy on Earth originates from solar energy. Yes, the sun. Yay for the sun. And that's gonna be transferred through the process of photosynthesis. And what is the purpose of photosynthesis to form? Not all at once, but you guys should be saying in your heads, glucose. Yes, glucose is the purpose of photosynthesis. So now I have this glucose molecule. It's a chemical molecule. It's got energy stored in its bonds, but we're not finished yet. How am I gonna get that into a usable energy that the cells can actually use for their chemical processes? And so that's going to be another energy transfer from the, the energy trapped in the glucose bonds through the process of cellular respiration. We're going to transfer that energy to ATP, which is the whole purpose of cellular respiration. So think of it as just one big energy transfer process, and it's a two-step process. Photosynthesis first, taking that solar energy into a chemical energy glucose, and then cellular respiration, glucose to ATP. So we're gonna start with that first part, that first step, photosynthesis. And photosynthesis is gonna be broken down into many parts, but first, let's look at two cells here. Um, on the right here, I have an animal cell, and on the left, I have a plant cell, and I know it's a plant cell because of the outside structure, that cell wall. So because of that, I know it's a plant cell. I also know it's a plant cell because of E, which is a chloroplast, which is where photosynthesis occurs. So this only happens in plants. If you notice over here in my animal cell, there are no chloroplasts. So chlor animal cells cannot perform photosynthesis. Okay, so we can just cross those guys out. They cannot do it, only plant cells. So then my question becomes, what is the chloroplast and there are some parts here that we do need to know we need to know all the structures of the chloroplast especially where the different stages take place so real quickly let's go through them we have the outer membrane which is on the outside of the cell or the chloroplast i mean it's on the outside of the chloroplast and then we have the inner membrane which is two layers in so yes this is a double membraned organelle Okay, and then we have the thylakoids, which are going to be these like little stacks like here. They look like a stack of quarters. Each individual quote unquote quarter is going to be called a thylakoid. And then that whole stack together is down here E, which I'm going to reveal in a moment, is going to be the granum. And then that space that these are all sitting in is going to be the stroma. Okay, so my question is, is what are the two stages of photosynthesis and where do they take place. So the two most important parts that we're going to look at are the thylakoids, specifically the membranes, and then that's going to be where the light dependent reaction takes place. And then we're also going to look at the stroma because that's where the light independent reaction takes place. So let's take a closer look at those two reactions. So this is my chloroplast again. You can see the double membrane. You can see over here that I have a granum. Okay, and you can see right here that I have a thylakoid disc. And there's actually several here stacked on top of each other, but we're going to look specifically at this top one. Now, I'm going to divide this in half because out here is the stroma. This is the stroma. Okay, and 
then that's going to be where the second part of my photosynthesis takes place, which I'm calling the Calvin cycle in this page. Over here, that thylakoid disc is going to be where the first stage takes place. And we call that first stage, we call that first stage the light dependent reaction. If you depend on something, that means you need it. So this reaction that's gonna occur in the thylakoid disc is dependent, it needs light. Where on the other side, my Calvin cycle is also known as the light independent reaction, meaning that it does not depend on light. So we are not gonna need light for the second half. So that's why I have like a dividing line here. All right, so let's look specifically at the light reactions. What's gonna happen here? Well, first, right along the thylakoid disc, we're gonna have something called chlorophyll. Chlorophyll is a little pigment that's right along the membranes of the thylakoid disc. And what pigment is able to do is absorb light. So light's gonna come in, it's gonna be absorbed by that chlorophyll. It's gonna absorb all the different colors of light except for green, and that's why we actually see green. Whatever's reflected is what we see. So we see green, so green's not being absorbed. All the other lights are being absorbed, okay? During that, it's gonna capture some electrons. Water is gonna come in and split apart and donate some hydrogens to this. And that's gonna go through an electron transport chain. And we're gonna see what happens there is that those are gonna be transferred to ATP and NADPH. And this is gonna be really important because these are high energy molecules. We know ATP is a high energy molecule, but this, remember, this light reaction only gives us one ATP, one NADPH. As a result, when that hydrogens are broken off from the oxygens to do this process, we're going to get a byproduct of oxygen. And thank goodness that happens. Everybody take a deep breath in. Yes, folks, you just breathed in oxygen. I'm so thankful that this is a byproduct of photosynthesis because we're gonna need that later for cellular respiration. So keep that in mind. All right, so, so far, just to keep track, light has come in to this reaction. It's been absorbed by chlorophyll. Water has come in to do some electron donation. We've gotten oxygen out and we have formed an ATP molecule and an NADPH molecule. These are really important because they are gonna provide the energy needed for the Calvin cycle. And what happens in the Calvin cycle is I'm gonna have some carbon dioxide come in to the Calvin cycle. I'm gonna get energy from ATP and NADPH, and that's gonna go through this Calvin cycle, be reconstructed with the hydrogens from water to form sugar or glucose, which is what we know is our main purpose of photosynthesis. Okay, well, what happens then is once I've had those hydrogens break off, I have NADP and ADP, and they can be recycled into the light reaction to form, go through that process again to form ATP and NADPH. So this is a cycle here. And we also have the Calvin cycle because some of the building blocks in the Calvin cycle are gonna be recycled to be used again. But the importance here, what we really need to focus on is what is needed for the light reaction is light. If I don't have light, this side shuts down, okay? The Calvin cycle or the light independent reaction can keep going for a while without light, no problem, doesn't need it. However, if this light reaction stays shut down for a long period of time, I'm not gonna have the ATP needed to continue on with that cycle. So just keep that in mind. Eventually, without light, this Calvin cycle is going to eventually slow down and eventually stop if it goes a long period of time without light. And this is why if you bring a plant inside, it'll be okay for a while, but after a week or so, if it's not getting any light, you're going to see it start to die. Okay, so this brings us to the overview of photosynthesis and some things that we need to know. We need to know our reactants. In other words, what we start with. Well, we start with light. What else are we entering in? We enter in oxygen, I mean, we enter in water and carbon dioxide. They come in, so six waters to be exact, six carbon dioxides to be exact, and then we get our products, which are coming out 
down here. So our products are going to be 6 oxygen and 1 glucose, C6H12O6. Okay, this is our equation. In other words, sunlight plus 6 water plus 6 carbon dioxide yields 6 oxygen and glucose, which takes us to our next step, which is the cellular respiration. So we're talking about our next step of cellular respiration in the two-step process to transfer energy from sunlight all the way to ATP. And this is going to focus on that energy transfer from glucose to ATP. Again, it's just energy transfer, and the process this does this is going to be cellular respiration. Looking at our two cells again, we will notice that in both cells we have this guy, and that is called a mitochondria. And a mitochondria is going to be the site of cellular respiration. So both plant and animal cells can form cellular respiration. So there's my little diagram for that. Both plant and animal cells can form this. So let's look at the mitochondria. What can the mitochondria do? What is it made of? Well, the first thing that we need to look at is all the different structures here. And we have starting with, hold on just a second. Okay, starting with A, we have the outer membrane. Then we have the inner membrane. Next, we have that space between the two membranes, which is called the inner membrane space. We then have the matrix, which is that space right in the middle, represented with a light yellow color. Each one of these folds is called a cristae. And then outside, a very important area outside the mitochondria that all of our organelles float in is called the cytoplasm. It's gonna play a big role here too. There are three parts to cellular respiration glycolysis, which starts in the cytoplasm. Then we have the Krebs cycle, which is going to happen in the matrix. And then we have the electron transport chain, which is going to be all along that inner membrane, which is why we have to have so many cristae, so many folds. The more folds, the more membrane space we have, the more electron transport chains we can have along that membrane. All right, so let's take a look at the cycle. We're going to start with glycolysis outside of the cell. Glucose is going to enter in, and it's going to be broken down to pyruvate. And when pyruvate, when this happens, when glucose is broken down to pyruvate, we're going to get two ATP. Next, pyruvate is going to travel into the matrix of the mitochondria. It's going to be attached to, it's going to be broken down and attached to a coenzyme A, and we'll get acetyl, acetyl CoA, which is going to enter the Krebs cycle. But when this goes on, we're gonna get some carbon dioxide out, okay? We'll get it out from the Krebs cycle and acetyl-CoA. We're also gonna get two, P two ATP out of that. Then we're gonna to get to the electron transport chain. This is where oxygen enters. We're gonna get water out, and we're gonna get about 32 to 34 ATP. So all together, we're going to get around 36 to 38 ATP. And another very important, I wanted you guys to notice this. As we go through glycolysis, one of the things you're going to see is that we're going to create an electron carrier. Same thing here, this process from pyruvate to acetyl-CoA, we're going to create some electron carriers. From the Krebs cycle, we're going to create more electron carriers. And these are going to be very important, these NADH and FADH2 electron carriers are going to enter into the electron transport chain, and that is what's going to drive that process for us to get ATP. So keep note of that. These other processes, glycolysis, Krebs cycle, their main purpose is to create these electron carriers for the electron transport chain to run off of. Now, question. What happens if I don't have oxygen? If I take that out of the equation, can I still form ATP? Well, if you notice, I have two ATP right here. So if I get rid of this whole side and I just look at this side, I can go through a process called fermentation. There's two types, alcoholic fermentation and lactic acid fermentation. The important thing to know here is that we go through glycolysis, we get pyruvate, we form an NADH, 
That's going to be reduced back as pyruvate is either converted to alcohol or lactic acid. It's going to be reduced back to NAD+, and we're still going to get 2 ATP out of it. So even though we only get 2 ATP, we can still get some energy from just going through glycolysis. And this is going to be important because sometimes whenever you're working out, you may starve your muscles of oxygen, meaning that you're making them work harder than they can actually, and faster than they can get oxygen to the cells. So your cells and your muscles will go through lactic acid fermentation in order to keep up with your body's needs. So it's not, it's not perfect, doesn't get us a lot of ATP, but it allows us to keep functioning. Also, we have some anaerobic bacteria that do this process as well. And those are the two names you guys need to know. If it has oxygen, it's aerobic respiration. And if it does not have oxygen, it's anaerobic respiration. All right, so let's look at an overview of cellular respiration. Our reactants, what's going in? Well, we have glucose. We have glucose and oxygen going in. Glucose and oxygen are, we're gonna yield carbon dioxide, water, and about 38 ATP. In other words, glucose plus six oxygen yields six carbon dioxide plus six water plus 38 ATP. Which wraps us up, I want you guys to compare these two equations. So if you'll look at, these are the same pictures we just looked at for photosynthesis in cellular respiration, but I've put them on their side so that you guys can see the connection here. My glucose that is created as a product in photosynthesis and my oxygen that was a product in photosynthesis are now going to be the reactants of cellular respiration. The carbon dioxide that is a product of cellular respiration is going to be a reactant of photosynthesis. Same with water. Water is a product of cellular respiration but a reactant of photosynthesis. So we have a cycle here. Okay, And what's happening is that energy is being transferred from sunlight all the way to ATP through this process. So again, solar energy is going to come in. It's going to go through photosynthesis. We're going to get our products, glucose and oxygen, which are the reactants of cellular respiration. We're going to get our products of ATP and carbon dioxide, which become the reactants of photosynthesis. And this just continues to cycle around. There is one problem with this picture, and I'm wondering if you can guess what it is. If you're saying, wait, doesn't cellular respiration also occur in plant cells? You're absolutely right. So we need to add a plant on this side and know that there are mitochondria right here that are also playing an important role in cellular respiration. It happens in both types of cells. Well, that's it. That is my overview of photosynthesis and cellular respiration. I hope that this helps. Again, your essential question is, how is solar energy converted to a chemical energy that can be used by cells? And that goes through both processes, photosynthesis and cellular respiration. Thanks for watching.